One thing I've been noticing a lot lately is, um, well, first of all, are you familiar with Daniel Schmachterberger's work and Jordan Hall and these kind of sense maker types? I believe so, yeah. Okay. So they talk a lot about this idea of cognitive sovereignty, your, your ability to look out in the world, per what? cognitive sovereignty. Yeah. Uh, perceiving the world, sense making, and agency. And one thing I've noticed quite a lot um, coming to the West to go to conferences and stuff is that people seem to be increasingly willing to outsource their sense making and sovereignty to external agents. And to me, it seems to be just kind of a phenomenon or a result of um, the increasing complexity in the world and the fact that we have all of these tools on the internet to be able to filter information um, and pick and choose what we want to pay attention to and become experts in. But as a result, a lot of people are are choosing not to learn certain things like these these more general uh, connecting things like integral theory. And in doing so, they get stuck in this... Mm, I, I don't know. They get stuck in a, in a way of thinking that is just um, seems to be pretty orange rationalistic um, with and having a lot of problems transcending. So, I mean, I, I'm curious to know your thoughts about what to do about that. This, pro this problem of over filtering and, and not being willing to um, learn do your own yourself. sense making. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, <coughs> there are a couple of, um, of different ways of looking at that. And of all those areas that I mentioned um, about integral, um, ones that we've talked about are growing up and waking up. And then I said, we also see things like opening up and showing up and uh, cleaning up. Um, and all of these are having a, a type of impact on what you're talking about. But, but one of the major ways is if we look at just the growing up aspect of that in terms of just the developmental component of what's happening um, with some of those is what you, if you look at people that have really studied an individual's cognitive development, which is essentially what we're, what we're talking about here. Um, some of the best ones, uh, for example, include a researcher named Michael Commons. And what Commons does, and I'll abbreviate this just, just a little bit. Um, but starting at Orange, it, it's what he calls a, a systemic worldview. And because what Orange rationality can do is it really can think globally. So it can start to think about universal principles. And that's why it does start to create modern sciences, universal principles of physics and biology. There's, there's not Hindu biology versus Christian biology. There's just biology. That's an orange rational systemic um, point of view. And then when you move up to green postmodern, because each of these stages transcend and include Another way to talk about that is differentiate and integrate. So differentiate and integrate is also what's going on. And you see this as you look at, you know, just like a zygote starts out as a single cell and that divides into four cells, differentiates. And those divide into eight and then 16 and 32 and 64. And as that's happening, they start to integrate into different organ systems. So they're differentiating, integrating, differentiating, integrating. And we find that in human development as well. So what happens as you continue to move up these stages is each higher stage can reflect on the previous stage so it can differentiate. And then at some point you have to integrate those differentiations. So what happens with green postmodernism is that it differentiates all those systems that orange created. And when it does that, it will create a what Commons calls meta systemic. And so metasystemic differentiates all the orange systems, but it can't yet integrate them. And so what it'll do is it's differentiating all these things is it'll look at like Western scientific truth and it'll go, wait a minute, you can't just say that's truth. All these other countries exist and they have truths that are just as important as ours are. So they end up supporting things like multiculturalism and diversity and so on, all of which is fine. But the point is, at this stage in development, they can differentiate all of those, but they don't know how to integrate them. Mm. And so they, they really often will end up in this sort of, well, you know, what's true for you is true for you, what's true for me is true for me, and, blah, blah, and that kind of thing. Um, and then you have this leap to second tier, and 
commons like most uh, typical Western developmental models has, has includes about two or so major stages in second tier. Um, and, and the terms he uses are, are not exactly the best use of the terms, but you'll get the point fairly quickly. So um, the first stage she calls, that could start to integrate these differentiations, he calls paradigmatic. So what he means by paradigm is simply an actual activity, an actual knowledge quest that can integrate what green has differentiated. So you can actually start to produce whole integrated bodies of knowledge. And that's what a paradigm is, uh, as, he's, as he's using that term. And then after you have all these individual paradigms, then the next and highest stage of second tier is what he calls cross paradigmatic. And that's where you start looking at all the paradigms and attempt to bring them all together. And again, that's about less than 1% of the population. But some of the very, very bright folks who are talking about cognitive sovereignty are pushing into second tier. They're pushing into paradigmatic, which is sovereign into itself, or even cross paradigmatic, which is sovereign in the sense that now it's working with a completely unified reality. Um, and you can get a, a type of genuine sovereignty out of both of those. When you don't get a sovereignty of, of well, almost anything, is at green meta differentiated reality. And that's the real core of what we have with postmodernism. And so that's a lot of the problem is that most of the leading edge of today's bright people, there are three or 4% of them at second tier, but there's 20 to 25% at green. And that's postmodernism. That's the core of postmodernism. And that's the core of what a lot of that type of, well, I don't want to assert anything kind of statement comes just in looking at developmental terms. There are other factors that play into that, but just in, in developmental terms, that's one of the main things that, that's happened. And, and what we find with the whole postmodernism in general is that it is these screen, um, metasystemic, multicultural, diversity, egalitarian notions taken to extremes. Um, and so, and they become contradictory at that point. So it's common for postmodernism, for example, to claim that there is no objective truth, that that's just a cultural construction and it, it doesn't actually exist as, as a reality. But what they're claiming, of course, is that their statement that there is no objective truth, that those are cultural constructions. They're claiming that is true. And they're claiming it's universally true. And they're claiming it's true for all people in all places at all times. You can't get more universal truth than that. But they, of course, deny there's any universal truth. If they were really, if they really meant what they were saying, they wouldn't believe anything they were saying. Because they're all they're claiming it's truth, but they say there is no truth. And that's just the start. I mean, it, it's that kind of performative self-contradiction that is extremely, extremely common. I mean, even if you look at the great postmodern, recognized postmodern philosophers like Derrida or Foucault or Bourdieu and so on, Foucault actually wrote a book called The Archaeology of Knowledge. And that was because he had started out as a structuralist, who's somebody who actually studies the structures of these different stages of development. And that's one of the things that Piaget, for example, made very famous. And Piaget, by the way, got it from James Mark Baldwin, the guy who discovered growing up. When Baldwin stopped teaching at Harvard and retired, he went to Paris and taught at Paris for a while. And one of the several famous students that he had was a Swiss student named Jean Piaget. And that's where Piaget learned uh, um, about these kinds of things. So you have these types of um, postmodern philosophers. And what Foucault was doing, he had originally written some books looking at, at these different epistemes, these different worldviews that several major stages of European development had created. 
And so he, he was curious about how different cultures could have these different worldviews. So he wrote this book, The Archaeology of Knowledge. And he said he literally was at the end of that book when he realized that the whole book was a self-contradiction. Because what he was doing was he was saying, these are the elements in the cognitive structure that produce these different worldviews. So he's claiming that these elements are the same in all these different worldviews. In other words, and as the claim of the book was that every culture has a different worldview and you can't find anything they have in common. But what they all have in common is his book, if his book is correct. So he's contradicting himself. He's saying there is no common element to those cultures, except everything I'm saying. Everything in this book is common to all of these cultures. And that's what they had. And that's like, oops. That was the beginning of the postmodernist rampant self-contradiction. And it's a real problem. And it doesn't cure up until you get into second tier and start to realize how you can actually integrate all of those different types of cultural values. And it turns out you can't because some of them have more depth and some of them have less depth. Some of them are more inclusive. Some are less inclusive than others. And that's a scale of more inclusiveness. It happens to be the same scale that an individual in today's world, those are the same stages an individual will go through as they grow and develop. So we are finding some very important common themes that show up. And these are, these are one of them. Um, what we do, the real problem right now is that we have a leading edge of culture that's essentially not just green and egalitarian and multiplistic, but it's a broken green. It's an extreme green. It takes its own views absolutistically. And that's a huge problem because that is the sort of leading edge. Starting in, well, in 1959, for example, in the United States, 3% of the population was at green egalitarian, multiplistic, multicultural. By 1972, Jacques Derrida was the most frequently quoted academic in America, and the percent of the population at Green had reached about 13 or 14 percent on its way to around 20 percent. And so postmodernism had become, again, sort of the leading edge. If you were smart and bright and you were born in the 60s or 70s, and you wanted to sort of go to the head of the class, you developed a grain. That was where you stopped. And that was how you looked at the world. And that was what was so important. By the way, it was right when that happened, and academia itself became green, basically, in its leading edge. That's when developmental studies, those were all thrown out by this extreme green, because green doesn't recognize higher or lower in anything. Everything is absolutely equal. So if you have stages, even of more inclusiveness, you're racist or sexist or transphobe or xenophobe or misogynist, you're bad. You are a morally bad person. And they don't distinguish between dominator hierarchies which are all the bad things they say about hierarchies, and growth hierarchies, which go from electrons to atoms to molecules to cells to organism. And in human beings, they go from stage to stage to stage to stage. And growth hierarchies, the higher you are in a growth hierarchy, the more inclusive, the less oppressive, the less marginalizing you are. So even green values themselves, you're not born with green values. You have to go through at least six stages of development to get to a point where you think green values are great. But they didn't do that. They just put all hierarchies together, threw them all out as being, you know, Nazi. Um, and that's the famous, that's the, the most common charge that you will get if you mention any sort of hierarchies. You're a fascist, you're a neo-Nazi, you're a Hitler. It's like, it's unbelievable. Um, so um, they tossed all of that out. So even people 
going through academia at that point, like a lot of people in the intellectual dark web, or even like Jordan Peterson, is developmental growth, developmental studies, were just not part of the academic curriculum. And that's where they started to get left out of the picture. And that's part of the problem. And again, that's just part of what broken dream is part of the problem that it's, it's left us with. So, you know, it, it seems so interesting to me that a proper integration of orange and the application of orange to look at green and, and figure out the inconsistencies would set people on a track to second tier consciousness kind of naturally. Yeah. Well, um, it, part of the difficulty right now is that, well, let me put it the other way. One of the things that we can essentially anticipate in an optimistic way is what happens when 10% of the population starts to reach second tier. Because what appears to happen, if you look back historically, and again, we've just been talking about growing up stages a lot during this. There are a lot of other elements that, of course, an integral ap approach includes. But growing up is one that really gets left out um, a lot. And part of the difficulty with doing that is it is um, it simply cuts off access to these overall increasing and more inclusive aspects of our own awareness. So even something like green values, even, even if you're going to say, okay, I'm going to look, at least look at equal outcome and see if there's some sort of major disparities occurring there. Now, remember somebody like Jordan Peterson or a large number of the intellectual dark web doesn't want to include equal outcome at all. They just want equal opportunity. And that's, that's not a product of development. That's, that's their own conscious decision because they've, they've looked around and seen orange values so decimated and they start embracing those orange values. Then that's one of the choices that they make. But here's how something like equal outcome can be important. In around 1970, the percentage of college degrees in the United States that were gotten by men, by males, was about 69%. And the percentage of the degrees gotten by women was about 31%. And as a country, we sort of looked at that and said, that yeah, something's not right about that because by that time we had laws against if you discriminated against a woman getting into college that was against the law i mean you could be fined or even go to jail if you did something like that so we didn't have laws specifically holding women down but still this something just wasn't working here so what what was that if you're we had equal opportunity every law we had guaranteed equal opportunity but still only 31%, this is something's not right. So we paid attention to equal outcome. And we decided that that was an important area that we wanted to give attention to. So we started creating classes that would encourage women to take up some of these kinds of studies um, and, and, and did other social um, change um, maneuvers to help get a larger percentage of, of women through the college population. By 2015, the percentage of women getting college degrees had moved to almost 70%. And the percent of college students that were men was about 30%. So obviously, we changed that dramatically. And many people would say, well, oops, we went a little bit too far. Um, we still have equal opportunity. But now equal outcome is just getting really jerked around bad. So now it's common to find that there are books with titles like The War Against Boys, um, The Boy Crisis, uh, etc. And in many cases, it does appear that it went just a little bit too far, helped women along just a little bit too much while also holding males back. So what you want to do when you're at second tier and, and you're consciously paying attention to this is you want to balance equal opportunity 
with equal outcome. And that's a tricky maneuver because equal opportunity is often just called freedom. Even though both of these are forms of equality, equal opportunity is often called freedom. This means you have the freedom to you know, attempt to do anything that you want to. And an equal outcome is called equality. So you have freedom and you have equality. And I think Alex de Tocqueville was one of the first to point out that because human beings are born with differences, then you can either have freedom or equality, but you can't have both. Now, in a sense that that's correct, because if you have just complete freedom, let's say um, to sign up for the National Basketball, uh, National Basketball League, and, and there's actual equal opportunity, um, for various reasons, including um, the way they were raised or any number of factors you can mention, um, some 70 to 80 percent of the people playing that are African Americans. And there's almost no little short Jewish players playing basketball. So, but that's because there's complete freedom. The Jewish, short little Jewish player, he can try if he wants. He's got equal opportunity. He can try to get on the team and occasionally some of them will. Um, but if you're going to force the same number, then you're going to have to cut equal opportunity and you're not going to let as many blacks on. So you can have freedom or you can have equality, but you can't have exactly both. They're contradictory in terms of what they're actually trying to do. So, so what you do want to do as, as just the example of, of college degrees is you do want to pay attention to both of those because those are orange values and green values. They're equal opportunity and equal outcome. They're freedom and they're equality. And both of these clearly are important. And the real trick from second tier is that you want to balance those um, in a, as fair a way as, as you possibly can. And the thing that I was mentioning just about what we can find historically on these stages is that when the leading edge of a stage, of whatever the stage is at that point in history, when it reaches about 10% of the population, then there tends to be a, a sort of tipping point, a kind of flip tends to occur. So the Western Enlightenment, the percentage of the people at Orange, when that happened, was only about 10% of the population. But when that happened, then that rational, universal rational stage became the leading edge of our overall evolution. And that mythic ethnocentric previous stage, that was no longer the leading edge, this orange rational state to us. And so that's where we tended to replace mythic religion with rational science, and we developed world-centric values. We ended slavery. This was still only about 10% of the population. But what had happened is that when it does reach 10%, its values seem to sort of permeate the culture. At least people have heard of them and become a little bit more open to them. So the reason that slavery was ended, for example, is that this world century slavery is bad level had reached 10%. And that started to just filter through the culture. So they were open to ending slavery. We already saw that postmodernism, that hit when about 10% of the population hit green. Now, what we have worldwide, because that's still the highest stage that's hit 10%. So worldwide, we do have this sort of postmodern, multicultural set of values. And because of that, we're getting an intense polarization. And in part, this polarization is coming because everybody has their own truth. And so it, it, people just you know, fly apart. And they're still first tier. So when a person has their own truth and they're a different group than somebody else, they often might think that these two are, are sort of at war with each other. It really does look like there's nothing but a power hierarchies everywhere, and, and this is horrible. So we've just gotten more and more polarized. Really, in, you know, certainly in the United States, some people are saying that this is as polarized as we've been since the Civil War. And the problem is, as we look around at culture at large, we don't see many 
depolarizing or anti-polarizing or unifying forces on the horizon. All we see is just more polarization. And so when we get 10% of the population starts at what we call teal or the beginning of second tier, um, often called an integrated stage or even autonomous stage because of its sovereignty, um, that's going to be, uh, and we get that tipping point, then those values are going to sort of see through the culture. And we're going to have a counter balancing force to this horrid polarization. And I think that's one of the most important things that's going to happen on these interiors that we no longer track very much. Um, that's one of the most important things that's going to happen in the future. And that could happen as soon as um, 10 to 15 years from now, because it really is a leap, a, a cataclysmic, monumental leap of meaning from first tier to second tier. That's going to be something close to a cultural singularity. And that's going to happen at about the same time that people think there might be something like a technological singularity. If not an actual singularity, then a damn big technological machine, super intelligent machine. So we're going to get this sort of massive shift that's coming in anywhere from 15, 20 um, years. And that looks like it's just on track to happen. And we don't really have to uh, do anything. It's, it's simply headed this way. And that's going to be a very, very interesting time. It also would mean, by the way, that as at least 10% of the population moved into second tier integrated stages, that more and more individuals, including academics, would find integral models attractive. And not as many people would find my truth is true for me and your truth is true for you. And we can never get the two together. Um, they're all incommensurable value systems and all they can do is have power uh, tyrannies between each other. That worldview is going to start dying down and more integrated worldviews um, will very likely start. Now, it just depends on what the super intelligent machines uh, are going to be. So we're going to have to program them to recognize as much truth as possible, or we'll definitely be in trouble. <laughs> Enter the Future Thinkers giveaway and win our brand new community membership, including in-depth courses, private calls, and more, as well as a supply of Qualia, a complete cognitive upgrade for your brain. To enter the contest, simply go to futurethinkers.org slash giveaway and sign up for our mailing list to instantly get our 50-page guide on how to adapt to the future. There are many ways to increase your chances of winning. Enter the competition today. The brand new Future Thinkers members portal is now live. Develop your sovereignty and self-knowledge with our in-depth courses, get access to our weekly sense-making calls, join the Q&As with past podcast guests, and much more. Become a Future Thinkers member today at futurethinkers.org slash members. To stay up to date with new episodes, subscribe to Future Thinkers on your favorite platform. And leave us a review or a like. It really helps out the show. And don't forget to share this episode on social media.